Well, it actually took a couple days, but I do have my mirror and I've got my backer board plywood here and I have it sandwiched together and we can take a measurement so I know exactly how deep to make that rabbit. And it looks like we're coming in at about 7 16 of an inch. Of course, you're also going to want to check the length and the width and make sure that that works with a half inch wide rabbit that we're about to put on the frame. Mine was cut dead on, so I'm ready to go with the rounding. So I'm going to make the rabbit using this rabbiting bit and you can see it's got a nice bearing here to help guide the work and depending on the size of the bearing you could change the size of the rabbit. So the one I have here gives me about a half inch from the bearing to the tip of the cutter and that's going to be perfect. So the only other thing I'll need to set is the actual depth that we measured before. And all I need to do to make that happen is just to take my setting here, draw with a nice sharp pencil, give myself a pencil line to reference from and then I could set my bit just like this. And here's a quick tip for you concerning router direction. You want to memorize the rule. On the outside of a frame, you go counterclockwise. But on the inside of a frame, you go clockwise. That's just the way it is. Memorize it. Now you probably notice that the rabbiting bit will leave us with a rounded corner and our mirror is not rounded, it's square, so we need to square this off with a chisel. I'm just going to use the existing sections that we've already rounded as a guide and use a nice wide chisel to kind of work my way over to where I need to be. Alright, so now we can do a little test fit with our mirror. Wouldn't just drop it in here, just to support it with your fingers from the other side. Oh yeah. That's nice. So what do you do if the fit isn't perfect? Let's say it's just a little bit too tight. Well, in this case, a rabbiting bit only has so many bearings that you can use, so it's hard to go in deeper that way. So what I would suggest is using a pattern bit. It's also bearing guided, but you can use a straight edge, just the clamp on straight edge and ride that across the straight edge to sort of expand this opening a little bit and push it back a little bit further. Um, hopefully you won't have to do that, but there's definitely ways to get the job done if you need to. All right, so now let's cut our backer board, make sure it's cut to the same size as our opening here, and we should be good to go. Just drop this bad boy in place, make sure it fits. Oh yeah, that's nice. Good fit. So of course to hold this back panel in, we're gonna need some sort of clip or something. So let's make some uh, shop made clips out of wood that we'll be able to screw in and it'll hold everything in place. The clips are made from scrap pieces from this project. While their dimensions aren't really critical, I milled them to a quarter inch thick by one and a quarter inches wide and two inches long. Each clip is then given a gentle round over and a light sanding. I'd like to have two pre-drilled offset holes on each clip, so I measure in a half inch from each end, and then about a half inch in from the side. I could then use a countersink bit to drill the holes. Now with a bunch of these clips around the perimeter, we can screw it to the frame and have an overhanging portion that holds the back panel in place. And we could just drive in some of these 3 quarter inch number 6 screws to make sure everything is firmly attached. And I won't use glue on this, uh, and the other thing is I'll probably want to drill a little bit into the frame to pre-drill, so we'll do that after the stain and finish and everything is applied. Uh, this is as far as we'll go with these. Well, there's one more treatment I want to do to our frame here. I want to give it a nice round over all the way around the perimeter, as well as the inside perimeter and the back. And that's not only going to look good, but it's going to make it feel nice to the touch. And I've got my trim router set up with a little tiny round over bit that should do the trick. Well, now let's give our frame a final sanding to 220 and then 320 grit. So the finishing aspects of this project are going to be a little bit more complicated than I normally like. I usually like a nice simple finish and with a wood like this it doesn't take much to make it look absolutely beautiful. But in this case because it's going in a bathroom where cabinets are already in place we need to match a manufactured finish that's on those cabinets or at least come close. Now the good thing is because the grain of our frame is so busy that's going to distract the eye and I don't think it's necessary for us to have an absolutely perfect match. Uh, furthermore there's a physical separation between the mirror 
and the vanity that's below it. So I've got one of my drawers here so we could look at the finish that's already on there, sort of identify some of the properties of it, and see if we can't come up with something that's in the ballpark of this finish. Let's take a close look. So the wood here is definitely maple, and the color isn't all that special, it's just kind of a medium brown color. But the thing I want to point out is some of these darker areas in the nooks and crannies. Um, and this is even more evident on the doors in the, the bathroom. Uh, that's got some dark stuff in there. What that is, is a glaze. And a lot of these you know, cabinet companies will do this. They'll put a base color on, then they'll put some finish on, and then they'll use a glaze to kind of darken and create shadow lines and give it sort of a, a bit of an aged look. So that's a pretty popular thing to do. So we'll have to try to replicate that with our frame. Now even though I've got some experience with color matching, I used to work in a refinishing shop where that's kind of all we did. We'd strip finishes down and try to get it back to something uh, that matches what the customer wanted. So we mixed a lot of our own stuff and that gets complicated, but sometimes it's the only way to get the color you need. These days I like to go simpler. I like to find off the shelf products that get me in the ballpark of where I need to be. And this way I can usually depend on that same product being available a couple years from now instead of having to look through a notebook and try to find a perfect recipe. So what I had in my finishing cabinet were a couple different things. I've got a wood stain here from General Finishes called Pecan, and then I've got a Van Dyke Brown glazed effect. And let me show you with a sample board exactly how this is gonna go in the progression from raw wood to finish. On the first panel, I just have my stain, this pecan water-based stain. In the second panel, I clear coated it just to kind of lock that color in and get ready for the glazing. In the third panel, I have my glaze applied. It's been uh, sort of applied liberally and then wiped off. And the goal, again, is for it to find all those little nooks and crannies and give it a more aged look, which is kind of hard to do on a flat surface like this. But anyway, on the fourth panel, I went back and applied my clear coat on top of it to, just to kind of give me an idea of what the final look would be. And this is what we would use to compare against our existing piece. Now, of course, that's not perfect, but I honestly feel like this is close enough to get me where I need to be. Uh, most eyeballs will notice the incredible figure of the frame. It's gonna be, um, dare I say, overwhelming <laughs> compared to everything else in that room. It'll definitely catch the eye. Um, so I'm not too worried if the color is just slightly off. Using off-the-shelf products, I'm happy with this result. Now, because our stain is water-based, we have to pre-raise the grain before we do anything else. When freshly sanded wood gets wet, the grain raises and the surface feels rough. Pre-raising the grain prevents that from happening when we apply our stain or finish. So I simply wipe a liberal amount of water onto the surface of the frame. After it dries, I sand it lightly with 320 grit paper, just enough to remove the roughness. Now I can apply the stain using a cotton rag, also known as an old t-shirt. Water-based stains do dry quickly, so it's important not to drag your feet here. I'm wiping the stain on liberally and then wiping the excess off one frame piece at a time. By the time you have the back done, you should feel much more confident as you approach the more important front face and edges. And while I've got the stain out, I'll throw some of that on the clips too. Now the good thing about the stain is that it's pretty easy to fix mistakes. Here's an area where I got a little bit sloppy, and it's already dry. A damp rag is all it takes to clean it up. The next step is to apply a clear coat. I'm using Sherwin-Williams Cab Acrylic Lacquer with my HVLP turbine. The sheen I'm using is called Medium Rubbed Effect, which to my eye just looks like a semi-gloss, so we need to make sure that the material is stirred well. I then fill my cup with the finish as it passes through a paint filter. This will remove any dried finish or impurities. I do my spraying outdoors, which is pretty convenient in Arizona where the temperatures are warm, the air is dry, and we don't have much in the way of airborne bugs. I start by spraying the edges and then the front face of the frame. The purpose of this first coat is to simply seal in the stain. If there's any roughness on the surface, I'll gently sand with 320 back inside the shop. Be cautious though, as you don't want to sand through that stain layer. Just knock down the major stuff. Now it's time to apply the glaze. The glaze is not really meant to act as a stain, which is why we sealed the surface. Instead, its purpose is to add dimension by depositing color into the nooks and crannies of a particular piece. That includes deep grain lines, edge profiles, corners, and in our case, the V-grooves that we cut into the joints. You simply paint it on, and then wipe off the excess, leaving material packed into the crevices. 
And you should note that I'm only applying this to the front and edges of the frame. There's really no reason to glaze the back. And although it doesn't really absorb into the wood fibers, it can certainly darken the surface a bit as some of it will adhere to the finish. The end result is a slightly more rustic and aged effect. I let the frame dry overnight and started with more lacquer first thing in the morning. I spray the back of the frame first, applying a nice heavy coat because this is actually the only coat that I'm going to apply to the back. Once dried to the touch, I can flip the frame and spray the front. I'll apply a total of two fairly heavy coats at this point. After a few hours of dry time, I'm going to wet sand the surface to level out the finish. Now we're not going to do a piano gloss finish here, so this is just a rough leveling. I use water as a lubricant and a sanding block with some 500 grit wet dry sandpaper. Use a light touch as the water will suck the block down to the surface and you can easily burn through the finish if you're not careful. A clean rag is then used to wipe off the water and the finished slurry. The surface should look mostly dull when you're finished. It's not perfect, but it's definitely better than it was. Now here's the secret sauce. The final coat of finish will be mostly lacquer thinner, with only a small amount of finish. I'd say maybe about 80-20. Because lacquer burns into itself, and lacquer thinner reactivates it, this thin mixture will add a final coat of lacquer that helps level the existing surface while providing a near perfect finish right off the gun. Furthermore, it has so much thinner in it that it dries incredibly fast, giving the environment less time to deposit crap into the finish. Alright, so the final finish is looking pretty darn good. Right off the gun at this point, I don't really think I need to do anything else. The good thing about a finish like this though is that if you needed to, you could certainly do some post-processing, if you will, where you smooth it a little bit more, maybe buff it to a high shine, whatever you want to do. But if you can get great results right off the gun, you don't necessarily need to do that. Now here's the thing, this finish highlights that you don't need an absolutely perfect environment to get a good quality finish. I sprayed outside in my driveway and my shop is kind of dirty right now. There's dust all over the floor, so it's absolutely an imperfect environment, yet somehow we get a really good finish. It just comes down to knowing the materials, knowing a few tricks for smoothing the surface and dealing with those airborne particles that are almost definitely going to settle into your finish. But there are ways to deal with them and get results like this. All right, so now that we have the finish applied, we have to protect that finish because we need to put it face down to apply the mirror and put some of our stuff on the back of it. Uh, so we'll come up with a way to protect it and get everything done. Well, I don't know about you, but I am fond of stealing blankets from the house and bringing them into the shop just for things like this. And now we can put in the backer. And now I'm just going to place my clips around in the approximate locations where they're going to go. I want two per side. I think that should be just fine. Each clip is then lined up and I'll grab my drill here just to pre-drill a little bit. Get it started. Now I'll drive those three quarter inch screws. There we go. So all my clips are in place and at this point you might be wondering how the heck are we going to hang this thing? Well, I've got these little metal clips here. They're called eagle clips. They are a lot like a French cleat system where one of these goes on the frame, the other one goes on the wall and they interlock nicely. It's a great way to hang something like this and gives it a lot of support. The problem is though, we have these clips here. So if I just mounted one on the frame, I would never actually be able to make contact with the one that's on the wall. So we'll need to just add a little spacer block made out of the same material that will go underneath this here. All right, and let me show you how I'm gonna attach it. Now, while one clip is good, two is gonna be better for this. So I'm gonna have one on each side. And the most important thing is that we keep this frame nice and level. So to ensure that, I'm going to measure up the same distance on both sides, about three quarters of an inch from where our backer board starts. Put a couple pencil lines, and then I'll be able to attach my support piece here. And same thing on this side, three quarters of an inch up, line it up, and I can attach it. I'm gonna first start with a little bit of CA glue here, super glue, to make sure it doesn't move on me. Now all I need to do is line up the clip at the top of the support. And I realize I'm kind of playing with fire a little bit without some kind of a marker to control the depth. So a little piece of tape will do. Now 
And now I'm just gonna drive the two screws. Now the key is that the screw needs to go through the clip, through the support, and into the frame if it's gonna be strong. Right, so I had to upgrade from the number six three quarters to a number eight one inch screw, and that should do the trick. Another thing to keep in mind here is if you really want to go with prettier screws, you can certainly do that. Uh, these aren't the most attractive ones. Of course, the same process on the other side. All right, let's see how we did. That's looking pretty darn good. Needs a little Windex, but that shouldn't be too much trouble. Uh, so at this point, the only thing left to do is hang it in the bathroom.